Another round of applause for our wonderful policy and um, airport owner presentation today. Yeah, so um, my question was actually for Vic. I don't know if it's still oh. here, but <laughs> but there's a question on the slide. He had um, alternative fuel corridors on there, so I'm curious to see if that was for like your electricity and hydrogen or something else entirely. Uh, we we called it alternative fuel to not just narrow it to electric, right? Um, to keep it open. So that was something that came out through the leadership team um, as as an emphasis area, and ironically, the DOT. Uh, central office was already doing um, the electric side of that. You remember they did their um, EV plan that they just completed like within six to eight months ago. So we're kind of taking that. The Hillsborough MPO is also doing um, another EV uh, plan for the local area. And then I know the Hills, uh, the Pinellas, uh, MPO Ford Pinellas was very interested also in that side of the conversation. So we wanted to have that on our radar of things to kind of pull, again, what we do sometimes these lines like connect the dots, right? There's already these great initiatives um, that are moving forward. So we're trying to pull them in and help align the region towards one direction. So it is multiple fuels, but the first step has kind of been electric and EV. Thank you. Um, this is this is for anyone or all of you, um, but I'll, Brett, you talked about kind of these first use cases, first locations, GIFs offsite, the airport, um, and that airport connection um, use case. Are you simultaneously looking at um, your other regional airports and um, fi and fixed wing or? Uh, EV toll or, or stole um, uh, connective system um, within those airports uh, at, while you do this here close to the airport as well? Yes, yeah, certainly. So uh, we look at all of our airports as a system, and we're currently undergoing a master plan at Tampa Executive Airport as well. So advanced air mobility is a part of that master plan scope uh, as we go through this process. We expect that there will be a, a benefit to having a network of multiple uh, facilities that can support that, and definitely something that we're focused on here at Tampa International Airport, for sure. I would add that the majority <coughs> of the companies that the agency has been hearing from want to operate from the underutilized general aviation op airports. Um, so operators are going to, or manufacturers are going to come knocking on your door if you're a GA airport because um, they have a lot of desire to, to use your infrastructure and build in those markets. Yeah, to echo that, it kind of goes back to what I said earlier. You know, just because you're not necessarily a target airport for OEMs uh, within the state doesn't necessarily mean you can't play a role. And that goes back to the concept of a village. It's going to take a village. So there's always going to be opportunities for airports that may not necessarily be on the radar of OEMs uh, to play a critical role with the integration of Florida, AAM in Florida. Yeah, just one thing I would add to that is, is the term I heard Carrie use earlier, uh, ecosystem. And that's really what we're excited about for, you know, from a regional standpoint. It's not just these point-to-point -point solutions that it provides, uh, but the entire ecosystem and the jobs that it supports, the manufacturing, the maintenance, the service, all of these things will not be parked downtown on a rooftop somewhere. They will likely reposition and likely use general aviation airports uh, for a lot of different use cases. And I think it's a great benefit to our general aviation airport system to be prepared for that. And I think I would encourage all airports to be very, very proactive in this process and making sure you're doing your homework, being educated on advanced air mobility and really seeing um, that we're not reacting to this industry, that you're preparing your airports for a future that will look very different than it does today. Like Thank you. <laughs> Actually, related to the last point there, uh, Marcus, I'm a general aviation pilot uh, here in the Tampa Bay region, and we currently have hangar shortages, ramp shortages. All these vertiporta signs are very small, but these, on if, uh, one of the slides mentioned over 100 airplanes or EV tolls eventually in Tampa Bay. They're not going to be flying at nighttime when there's no demand or in inclement weather when we have thunderstorms around. So what I haven't seen site plans for these mega hubs, they got to be parked somewhere at nighttime. Um, so I guess the GA airport you just mentioned can handle that, but kind or not. So where's the thinking in that, but from an FAA perspective and a regional perspective, where are these guys going to park at nighttime? 
Uh, that's that's a great question, um, and I think you're going to hear from some folks later today, the operators and developers, that they are thinking about those issues as they're starting to work through their site plans, right? While the FAA only has that limited interim guidance out there, um, you're going to find that the developers and operators out there that are thinking much bigger than where the agency is just right now on standards, right? We released that interim guidance based off of the initial findings we had from some of our work with the manufacturers, but we're learning more. And so future guidance is going to be much more inclusive, um, much broader in scope um, to, to look at more of an, um, uh, a full vertiport ecosystem than just what we have in the en engineering brief. Um, my name is Chris, and um, I'd like to know uh, how you all planned on working with the military and the military's innovation units. Um, I personally work with AFWorks and with the Spark Cells within the Air Force as an Air Force veteran. I work closely with DARPA as well. Um, I, I help create the Veteran Fund, and the Veteran Fund is a dual-use venture capital firm, and we invest in dual-use technologies. And um, Brett, I'm glad that you talked about ecosystem. I'd like to thank Allison for her work at the Hub because of her work bringing together the ecosystem and supporting companies like Lone Star that we've invested in. You are doing the work that's going to allow a lot of what happened today. So thank you for making a home for that because that ecosystem is going to be what allows this to happen. So how do we create a dual use ecosystem that works with organizations like AFWorks and DARPA in order to have what every early stage company needs and what we all need in order to make what you guys talked about happen, which is the, fu the funding and the non-diluted capital matched with the venture capital to, to make this a reality, what you talked about today. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much for that question. Um, you know, so we are working closely with our agency partners like NASA, as well as AFWorks and Agility Prime. In fact, we're hoping to uh, announce here very soon, probably in the next month or so, that we're going to be um, we, um, having a memorandum of agreement with the Air Force so that we can leverage their testing that they're conducting with the manufacturers and with, with all of these innovative technologies, and we can learn from it. And there's gonna be some things that are gonna be different, right? Some of those aircraft that are currently working with AFWorks and Agility Prime aren't necessarily what we're going to see in the certificated aircraft, right? So the agency is still going to have to do some of our own homework, but we definitely want to learn and leverage where we can. And so more to come on that, but we are for sure having very good conversations. In fact, my team just had a conversation about electrification of um, one of the airfields in, I believe, the Panhandle of Florida area, um, and learning from um, um, all of the different um, aspects of how do, you, how do you put charging into the airport environment. Yes, we've got developers out there that are doing it, but hearing it from an agency partner gives us a lot more perspective as well as, than just a private side. So thanks for the question. Hi, um, I just have a quick question about uh, kind of policy and how this is you know, gonna project um, onto other agencies. And if you guys have had coordination with like NFPA and updating their regulations, um, because we know that of course electric batteries and such burn hotter than you know, our fuel sources and things like that. And um, as a, I'm a civil engineer, so uh, as a kind of designer land developer, it's real important for me to kind of understand what those regulation changes are going to be as we move forward. Yeah, thank you for that, because actually it was one of the things that we didn't have in my slide deck. Um, so we realized this is a whole new arena for firefighters in particular, right? Um, and so um, the FAA is kicking off, or just kicked off, um, some research specifically geared towards um, ARF, Aircraft Rescue Firefighting Tactics, the agent we use, um, the operations for handling electric aircraft on the airfield. We're hoping to learn quite a bit from that. The folks that have been working a lot of the foam issues are going to be 
now tackling some of that electrification issue. Uh, NFPA has been working on this. In fact, they're updating um, or they're creating a new vertiport standard, which I'm sure my colleagues here or, or some of the speakers who can hear later today will be able to speak in more depth about. Um, but there is definitely a lot of work going on and a lot of, again, using that term, leveraging what we know from electric vehicles and trying to figure out how does that uh, transfer into the airfield environment. I have a follow on that. Thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Finn Bonset with VHB. Just a quick question, I think more for Nick and for uh, for Kerry. Um, just from a from a funding perspective in the future, right? So um, we do quite a bit of master planning, and our clients, airport clients, are asking, okay, well, what 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 could be fundable in the future, especially since this is in the in the sustainability world as well, right? So airports are looking at microgrids. They're looking at alternative energy, solar, wind. Is that something that you're already starting to think about? From the state's perspective, obviously that is something that we are thinking about and have had conversations about and clearly being approached from uh, industry as well as, you know, our district uh, officials that are out there like with the likes of Ray uh, here who's with us today in District 7. So there's a lot of conversations around uh, what the state's position is on funding. I think a lot of it uh, will be driven by once we actually get, in my opinion, a solid bill, and once the bill is solid, then I think that will help drive the efforts for funding from a state's perspective. So from a federal perspective, this is a little bit of a third rail. <laughs> um, so for, for funding, we need standards and we need justification. All right, so we've got interim standards out there. We don't have any certificated aircraft yet. We've got a little bit of an issue here. That doesn't mean that you can't be thinking about it as you're planning, right? And we really encourage everyone to be thinking about it, even if you are an airport that isn't necessarily, or a community that isn't necessarily getting um, operators' interest right now, think about electrification and any utilities work that you're gonna need to support the broad range of electric aircraft that are going to enter the market in, in this, in, in, across the NAS. Now, there are quite a few proposals within reauthorization that may lead to additional funding mechanisms. But again, we're gonna have to take a look at uh, the operations of these vertiports, right? Um, are they public use? Are they publicly owned? And that will all factor into whether you're going to see federal financial support for these or not. Uh, for the, Carrie, you mentioned Keeping the FAA informed of what we're doing at a local level, is, would you prefer, or I guess would that be through like our local folks like Bart and Pedro or reaching out to your office or does it kind of just depend on what we're doing? So his question was, as a local municipality, what's the preferred channel for communication with FAA? Is that through the airport's district office that's in Orlando or if that's directly with DC? Okay. so. My colleagues back there in the middle of the room, they are extremely busy. They got lots of stuff going on, lots of money trying to get out the door, important projects, right? And so we, we want to make sure you're engaging with them when you have uh, either you're starting to select sites, starting to down select sites, or you're ready, right? But if you're just dabbling, if you're just dipping your toes in the water on AAM and want to have a broader conversation with the agency about what is AAM? You know, what's the landscape? What should I be thinking about? That's when we tend to pull in our regional administrators who are able to bring the broad depth across the agency, including the Office of Airports, which Bart and Pedro and I represent, or our air traffic organization colleagues, or flight standards. And they'll be able to come to the table and provide that broader perspective. But if you're starting to dig in on sites, that's when you come knocking on the door for, for Bart shop. Do you guys want to add anything to that? <laughs> OK, good. <laughs> Thank you so much for your willingness to re-enter the uh, stage. <laughs> and let's give them a round of applause for that spontaneous uh, panel discussion. And thank you for all the great questions. These are all the things that we want to hear. All plays a part in the conversation.